All right, so now we're joined by Judge Veronica Galvan, who's running for Superior Court position 21. Let's go ahead with the two-minute introduction. Um, good evening, everyone. I'm Judge Veronica Alicia Galvan. Uh, Judge Galvan is fine. I uh, was appointed by Judge, by Judge, by Governor Inslee to the Superior Court in December of 2014, and I started in January of 2015. Prior to that, I was the judge for the city of Des Moines, Washington, the municipal court judge, where I was obviously, as the only judge, also the presiding judge. I was there for seven years. In my capacity as Des Moines Municipal Court, I'm proud to say that I did start and run the only Spanish language court in the state of Washington, providing language access to individuals who uh, had traffic infractions. So while they were minor matters in terms of the fact that they were traffic infractions, they were major to the people who appeared before me and were able to communicate directly with the court without the aid of an interpreter. Uh, additionally, I was president of the District of Municipal Court Judges Association. That is the statewide association that addresses issues of policy at the District of Municipal Court level. I was elected by my fellow judges in that role. I've been involved in governance, governance, judicial governance at the state level for over six years as a member of the Board of Judicial Administration, certainly as, as a leader within my own association, as a member of the Minority and Justice Commission. Uh, currently in Superior Court, I am stationed in Kent at the Regional Justice Center, where I handle both criminal and civil litigation matters. Uh, prior to being a judge in Des Moines, I was an administrative law judge for five years. Prior to that, I was a pros prosecuting attorney for both the cities of Seattle and Federal Way. I like to tell people I started my legal career when I was 12. People are having a hard time believing it now, though, so. And thank you for this opportunity. Great, so now we have our four prepared questions. Uh, these are two-minute answers, and actually that piece of paper right in front of you, if you turn it over, those are our questions if you want to read along uh, as we read them orally. And I think a uh, little bit, we do number one. How would you describe your judicial philosophy? I think my judicial philosophy is frankly an amalgamation of principles. Uh, first and foremost, do no harm. Uh, I think also uh, seek equity and justice. Um, that if equity, if the law and justice, I have an understanding that the law and justice don't always necessarily meet. There's a, certainly a natural tension working within a system that you know in some ways, in many ways, has been complicit in maintaining inequities within other systems. Um, but by the same token, I think that justice is the greatest invention of mankind. Because I think that if we seek it, if we live up to those principles that it espouses, that we can actually uh, find peace. It's the one thing that we've invented as humans to peacefully coexist. The problem is, is that in practice, we may not always get it right. I do believe that our court system is still uh, the best institution that currently exists to address inequities because it's the, the place where people go when they feel those issues um, have are, are part of their lives. Uh, in terms of other judicial philosophies, like I said, follow the law, and more importantly, seek justice. David? <clears throat> uh, do you support the current system of electing judges? Or do you support some other system, such as appointment, or an appointment and retention election hybrid? And if elections continue, what reforms of the current campaign finance rules would you support? Okay. Uh, in terms of electing judges, I think that that's a very difficult issue. Dispensing justice is a nuanced matter, and I don't think people appreciate the nuances of what we have to do. People just see the wonderful headline that says, you know, judge releases murderer. They don't understand the, 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 the nuance of the fact that, you know, maybe the Constitution is applicable and it applies to everybody, whether they did something good or something bad. But that's the principle that we've decided to uphold. So I, ha I have a problem, not necessarily a problem in electing judges, but, but I think that the nuances make it difficult because we're not allowed to, to talk about a lot of issues. They're, we're very restricted and yet we're still expected to participate to some extent politically. I think an appointment and retention system would take a lot of that out of it. I certainly would support a system like that. I think that we also need to be cognizant though that we need people from, we need our judicial 
bench to represent the diversity of our communities. I think in King County we're very fortunate in that regard, but that's not necessarily the, the case in other counties. Um, in terms of campaign finance, I have to admit that I breathed a sigh of relief last week when the Supreme Court ruled in the Florida decision that, which what I call the Judicial Citizens United, uh, potentially, that we aren't allowed to ask or solicit funds directly, and I think that that's very important. I think of all of the people who should be publicly financed, it should be judges. I really don't think that anybody on our behalf or ourselves should be soliciting funding to run for these seats. Despite everything that we build, and ethically we, we have a lot of hoops that we need to jump through, and, and I think the judges meet it, it's the perception issues that, that are a problem. Because if you, intentions are not perceived, what you see is, you know, your intentions are not my perceptions, is what I like to tell people. And I think that having judges um, asking for money or, or seeking solicitations it invites those improper perceptions. But by the same token, I even though I don't have a, an opponent, I am going through these steps because I do think that we also have a duty to educate our community about the issues that we see in our justice system and to get out there and say hello, whether we have an, uh, somebody running against us or not. So I do want to take those opportunities as well. Many people appear without attorney representation in Superior Court. In what ways is it appropriate for a judge to assist someone with the process of a judicial proceeding without appearing biased? I think certainly there's, uh, people appear in Superior Court pro se, as, as we call them, and, and it's difficult. We have a lot of outside assistance for pro se litigants in the Superior Court, but within the court, I think that you can do things to make the process easier. For example, you may have to understand what they're saying and what they're, the point that they're trying to make as opposed to the technical, say, evidentiary objection. Like they may have an objection, they may not know the technical name for hearsay or you know, 801 or 404 or you know, prior bad act, but they know that, that they don't like this evidence coming in. So if you can ask them, for example, to explain why they don't think that you, it's coming in, Instead of requiring them to have that technical knowledge, you can say, okay, so under this theory, this is applicable. Um, so I think that you can make it a little less stringent um, while still holding them accountable to, to the rules. The lack of um, civil legal aid is certainly a, a big issue within our courts. We see it. We see that that funding that being cut is is uh, impeding access, I think, for some individuals. And more and more, our courts are becoming so technical and the law is so broad that people there without the assistance of attorneys, I think, find it difficult to navigate. So I think um, whatever you can do to assist without obviously conducting the case for them. But uh, I, I think you, you do have to be a little wary of, of being too technical in some of those cases. Um, Maria, number four. Like the rest of government, courts have struggled with reductions in funding. Where can the courts cut costs and increase efficiency? And how would you advocate for sufficient funding of our judicial branch? And, you know, I've been an advocate for funding for our judicial branch for a while. <laughs> Certainly as president of the District Municipal Court Judges Association, I'm very active in social media and um, very active. I think last, last week I, I put out the Mike McKay's editorial opinion about funding for our courts. I don't know if any of you read that in the Seattle Times, uh, but Mike McKay wrote a, an opinion about the current budget proposals in the Senate, which essentially purport to cut significant amounts of the Supreme Court's budget. And it was said, it's not a secret, that this is essentially a retaliation for how the courts have ruled. That's dangerous, and I think um, what I did was I attached that article and I said said that uh, legislation through retaliation is not or retaliation is not the proper way to legislate, and and I think that we as judges need to step up because part of it is we haven't told you what we need, we haven't told you what we do, and when people don't know what we do, they're just like oh so they're cutting funding for the courts, nobody really <laughs> really cares, 
But when you start to hear that the reason they're cutting that is because the Supreme Court implemented a rule requiring people to have caseload standards for the defense of indigent mm -hmm. individuals because they were carrying too much, and in some cities and counties, they weren't um, properly defending people, then you start to see and connect the dots. When you tell people that the budget's being cut for training of judges, for judicial education, for judicial support, and you, and you tell them because uh, the Supreme Court held this state to its ideals in the Constitution, then I think people will start to lis listen. I mean, at the end of the day, the fact of the matter is, is if the legislature wanted to address McCleary, they could change the Constitution. It's within their bailiwick. But when you ask courts to interpret constitutional constitutions or the law, we have to abide by those principles. We don't owe um, allegiance to a party, to a person, or to uh, any individual. We owe allegiance to those principles of justice, to the Constitution, and to the laws. And that's where we have to make those decisions. Great. So now we'll open up to follow-up questions. So Joseph and Maria. Yes. So you mentioned that one of the, the tenets that you think that's important in electing judges is voter education. Mm -hmm. I've often found colloquially in talking with people that voting for judges is often one of the hardest decisions they have to make because it's a low information environment and it's hard to distinguish candidates mm -hmm. from one another. Mm -hmm. So how do you tell your friends who are outside of the legal community about how they should vote and look for information, not how they should vote, not who they should vote for, but where they should find information. And how, how would you think we can improve the process? Well, votingforjudges.org is certainly uh, one place to find information. Um, certainly, uh, there are judges that are more and more on social media and using social media outlets to kind of become known and to kind of continue to educate the community about issues that impact our justice system. So I have found that social media has been a, a very good link. I think, um, just as an example today, I, I posted uh, an article by a U.S. District Court judge that talked about the, um, the sentencing guidelines and how we judges have essentially been silent on the issue of imprisoning so many people over so many decades. And what can we do as, as leaders of that third branch of government? And I, I, so, so I think that I would direct people to Google <laughs> because if you can't find somebody on Google in terms of their experience as an attorney, then you have to ask yourself, so what does this person do? Number two, I always tell people, you're, you're interviewing somebody from a job, for a job, so if you were going to hire a professional accountant, what would you expect your accountant to know? Because this is a profession. This is, you know, you just, you have to have that legal background. You should have somebody who's actually practiced law, because I, I believe it's hard to rule on an objection when you've never made one. Um, so those are, the, do they have judicial experience? If they don't have judicial experience, have they ever pro tem? Have they ever been a substitute judge? Have they acted as a judge in any capacity, uh, a neutral decision maker, arbitrator, et cetera? Those are the kinds of things that, that I tell people to look at. Look at their qualifications. Right. Yeah, so you mentioned you're on social media. I assume you mean publicly, not in a private. Setting. Oh, very publicly. And what do you think about that? So, so should judges comment on stuff publicly? Do, would people think that that, um, will they look at that and think, oh, this is how like, she's going to rule? Or, what do you think about all judges doing that? Well, I, I think it, you have to do it with care. Mm -hmm. You have to do it the same way, you know, if you're not willing to have that splashed on the newspaper, mm -hmm. you should be willing to comment on it on social media. I have both a, a personal page, but the fact of the matter is, as a public figure, there's nothing personal. I have Twitter, I have Instagram, you know, so I, I post pictures of myself at the Mariners game, you know, hashtag King Felix Knight. Um, you know, I, pictures of myself with other judges, I started a hashtag because people keep telling me I don't look like a judge. So I started a hashtag where I primarily take pictures of women judges and judges of color and the hashtag is what judges look like. And I started another one called what leaders look like because the, we have to let people know that we're out here and I think it's, it is our job to educate, not, not necessarily, when it comes to issues within the justice system, such as how efficiencies, things that are, are potentially harming us, or issues such as, we need to take the leadership on those issues. Mm -hmm. and, and that's where I think, frankly, we have failed as a, as a judiciary. 
and I, I'm certainly one of the people who's willing to, to step out there and do that. Not, not all of my colleagues are, I will tell you that. So there's a lot of, um, a lot of differences of opinion as to how that should be, especially with the idea of people friending you. And I'm like, you know, it's no different than, than being at a, for lack of a better word, a cocktail party. You know, there's a bunch of people that you're gonna meet constantly. Doesn't mean that you're friends. I mean, Facebook isn't, you know, they're not your buddies, they're not your pals, but. So in describing your judicial philosophy, one of the things that you said is that uh, the court system is the best institution that we know of today to uh, address inequities. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm curious, as, as, a, as a judge and as in the things that you've seen, what is the biggest challenge to that institution? I think the challenges to the institution is having people <coughs> differentiate from the institution of the court uh, and the system of justice because they are combined. But the system of the justice system, larger justice system, constitutes a lot more people. You have attorneys, you have the police, you have the prosecutors, you have uh, a lot more people that are involved within that system. The institution of the court is also within that system, but by this, at the same time, we have different um, things that we need to do. We have different functions that we need to perform. So when I speak of the court as an institution, I mean it as the institution that's been charged with uh, resolving disputes between parties, resolving issues when people have an issue with, say, their own government, and acknowledging that while we are a governmental institution that we have a, a somewhat of an outside role as well. I mean, I understand that nobody goes to court to see the referee. Nobody goes to, you know, watches a football game to see how the refs are doing, you know. But um, the refs are a very important part of it because they are what maintain the order, the rule, and ensure, hopefully, that things are being played out fairly. So when I talk about that, I talk about our court as a, as a singular institution versus the entire system of justice. I hope that answers your question. You've been at uh, the Superior Court for what, like five? <laughs> Three <six>. months. <laughs> yeah, 90 so, days. A, I started January 22nd, so April 22nd was 90 it, days. It sounds like you have some administrative experience being head of the municipal court, judges, associations. Um, what, if any, administrative changes, whether IT or otherwise, do you think the Superior Court could benefit from? Oh my god, IT? Or I would like to be in this century in IT. Let's just start with that. I don't know if you're aware of the systems that courts use, but statewide, the SCOMIS system was built, let's see, 1979. Wow. So when you look at it, it literally is still a black screen with these green lines. It's not anything that you would think of is today. That system is one of the things that this, the court is trying to rebuild and fund. That's not only at the superior court level, but also at the district municipal court levels. Um, there is no reason that we shouldn't have the capacity to uh, see information. People travel all over the country, all over the states. We can't even get a statewide judicial system that's common amongst all courts. You can't even imagine what that's hap what's happening at the national level. These systems are ancient, and they are unable to um, take in the information that we feed it. So those are the biggest challenges that we have administratively, and I think that those impact efficiencies that can be built within the system. So we're about out of time. If you want to take 30 seconds for a closing statement. Um, no, I'll, I'll wait that. I'll just speak informally to you. Thank you very much for your time. I do appreciate it. All right. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you.